Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dollars and Cents, the show where we discuss the business of football with Andrew Brandt of the National Football Post. Andrew, how are you today, buddy? I'm doing well, Sid. Good to be with you. Nice to have you. Now, you've got a very unique perspective on this standoff between Michael Crabtree and the 49ers, having negotiated all the rookie contracts for the Eagles this year, including first-round pick Jeremy Macklin. I mean, and what's your initial reaction to a player demanding pay based on where he thinks he should have been drafted as opposed to where he was actually drafted? Well, Sid, I think this negotiation has a lot going on behind the scenes that people don't know. It's easy for people to say, yeah, Crabtree should take what he's being offered. It's millions and millions of dollars. What's he doing? He's stupid. He's turning down all this money. Well, what's happening is there are a couple of contracts kind of mucking up the works. Uh, the 49ers are trying to pay him after the ninth pick, before the 11th pick, slotting him in at number 10 and bumping right up against B.J. Raji, who was the ninth pick in the draft. Makes sense. The Crabtree Cramp, however, Crabtree Camp is now focusing on the Darius Hayward Bay contract, which is much different. It's a receiver contract. They're trying to latch onto that for obvious reasons and talk about the escalators in that contract, which are which are performance standards that really bump up the contract as you get into the later years. And that's what Eugene Parker's strategy was earlier with the Larry Fitzgerald contract years ago where the Cardinals really had to do sort of a redo of the contract because it was getting so hefty in the later years due to those uh, escalators. So what we have here is really a division of where the focus should be. The 49ers want to focus on the slot, the Raji deal, the Maven deal, and the Crabtree camp wants to focus on more of that receiver deal at number seven. And all these issues are going on, and there's tampering charges, and there's other agents circling around Crabtree. So there's a lot of complications to this deal. Yeah, what about the latest tampering charge coming out of New York? There's always an issue with the Jets. First, it was the Brett Favre injury problem with Mangini last week. I mean, here Sanchez is 2-0. and He's a toast of the town. But there was a tampering charge levied, not officially, at least a rumor that the New York Jets were involved. How about that, Andrew? Well, it's a rumor right now. We don't know for sure, but it, 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 I guess it makes some sense to me because you have to ask yourself, looking at this situation, having been involved in negotiations for the past 10 years, why this player is not taking the deal. And I'm sure the Niners are asking that question to themselves, and they're maybe theorizing that, hey, maybe he has another alternative because in all looks to it, there is no other alternative. He either signs with the 49ers or he doesn't get paid at all this year, and next year he takes his chances. Well, maybe some other team is telling him, hey, you wait till next year, we'll pay you, we'll pay you what you want, whether you're the first pick, the 20th pick, the 15th pick in the draft. Maybe that's going on, and that's what the 49ers are believing to be going on, and that's why you'd have a tampering charge. But again, when you get to this point in mid-September, late September, and no one signed, you're looking for reasons. You're looking for answers why he would turn down this kind of money. Yeah, agreed. Now, you're a guy that knows all about leverage. Again, you did the contract for Macklin in Philadelphia, LaShawn McCoy as well. Here's a big problem right now for Michael Crabtree. Last I checked, San Francisco is 2-0. You know, they beat Arizona. They beat Seattle. So as the 49ers continue to win under Mike Singletary, that's got to really uh, you know, bite into Crabtree's leverage, no? Theoretically, yes. This one seems a little different because this one is really – Eugene Parker is a professional negotiator that's been doing this a long time. I don't think he would try to leverage if they were 0-2. I don't think the 49ers are trying to leverage that they're 2-0. and They have had some uh, weak passing statistics, which the other side could claim as well. But I think the fact is we've got to figure out when this thing is, what's the end game here? And if, if the end game is for from the Crabtree side to get this contract looking more like Darius Hayward Bay, may not happen. If the end game for the 49ers is to try to slot this deal, ignoring the receiver contract, three picks ahead of it, may not have a resolution soon. This thing may last a while. You know, everyone's asking me, do you think he'll sign before the November 17th deadline? A few weeks ago, I would have said absolutely. Now, you know, I'm not so sure. I guess my answer is I'm cautiously optimistic that he will. Yeah, I don't know half as much about it as you do, but I don't think he will. Interesting take from agent writer uh, from your site there, NFP Jack Bechter. He's hearing that other Sharks are circling Crabtree to possibly recruit him. Uh, as a personnel guy, would that help get the deal done? We talked about the possibility with the Jets tampering and other teams interested. Does that kind of speed things up? Well, you have a situation like this. You have a blue-chip player that obviously was recruited by tens, dozens, maybe even hundreds of agents and settled on one. And now the Sharks are out there, as, as was written about on our site, the National Football Post, 
that maybe there are others trying to get in, trying to get to Crabtree, saying, hey, I can get a deal done. Maybe agents saying, i got a great relationship with the 49ers. We'll get it done right away. My information is that the relationship between Eugene Parker and Michael Crabtree is stronger than ever, that Parker is more involved in Crabtree than he even was before when there were others kind of hangers around that were kind of making decisions for Michael. That's all been kind of rooted out, and now it's a close relationship. So I don't think he's going to change agents. I think that it's natural in the business, the competitive cutthroat world the agent business is, that people are circling, but I don't look for a change there, no. I look forward to next week, Andrew, because I want to talk more about the Dolphins and Stephen Ross and collective bargaining. So only about 60 seconds to go here. Tell me, the, the, the NFL can't be silly enough to allow any type of work stoppage. Everybody makes way too much money. This CBA thing's going to get worked out, right? Uh, again, I'm back to that cautiously optimistic. <laughs> and I can't answer it in 60 seconds. We'll do it again. But I'll say this. There seems to be a thaw in the relation between Roger Goodell and DeMaurice Smith, the head of the Players Association. There was a lot of rhetoric up until this point. Now they're meeting. Tuesday the 29th, there's going to be a big meeting between them. They have jointly announced their opposition to the, Wal the Williams case in Minnesota, saying that the drug policy is firm and players will be suspended. So I'm looking at a little bit of positive news, a little bit of optimism that maybe some negotiating will take place and we won't face the prospect of no football. Fantastic. I got to tell you, Andrew, I enjoyed this tremendously. I, I look forward to doing this each and every week. You've got tremendous insight. This was fun. Thank you so much, Andrew. We'll do it again next week. Looking forward to it. Again, we'll see you next week on Dollars and Cents right here at NFPost.com and, of course, OpenSports.com. Remember, you can find Andrew on Twitter at ADBrandt and catch all of his great writing once again at NFPost.com. For Andrew Brandt, I'm Sid Rosenberg, and as always, enjoy the football.